Senate Foreign Relations Committee will come to order. We uh, welcome, welcome our Deputy Secretary of State, Tony Blinken. I know he was in uh, Turkey until yesterday evening, and uh, we moved the hearing back a day. I would note that uh, we've uh, been trying to get Secretary Kerry in here for some time. Um, that has not been possible. Um, I don't want to diminish your appearance here because we're thankful to have you here, but uh, um, I, I think for obvious reasons um, he's not been willing to come. I think the focus of today's hearing will be Syria, and I don't think uh, anyone here can be proud of the United States' role in what is the greatest humanitarian disaster of our time. And what we've done to enable that to happen. Um, as I think about your appearance here today, um, I think in many ways it'll be helpful to us as we think about the next administration and as we think about the next Secretary of State and as we think about the relationship uh, that needs to, to exist between the executive branch and the Secretary of State's office. Um, I know that you came over from the National Security staff, so you were at the White House. Um, you came over uh, to the State Department. I know sometimes executive branch folks like to have their own people at the State Department. And I know, uh, for instance, you were to appear here yesterday, but the President ordered you to go to Turkey instead. And so it speaks to sort of the overlap uh, that exists sometime between the executive branch and, and the Department of State. As an observation, uh, the entire Syrian conflict, um, again, is something that we are not proud of. I don't think anybody here is proud of. It's interesting that many of the people in the foreign policy establishment have uh, even though I think they would view the Obama administration's foreign policy, generally speaking, as a failure, I think that's a, just an observation that I believe history will write. It's interesting that uh, Secretary Clinton um, has received support from much of the foreign policy establishment because I think it's so well known that she tried to counter so much of what um, has ended up happening and has lessened our standing in the world. And I think that's the reason that many people have migrated um, in the foreign policy establishment to her and, and are supporting her. I think all of us are aware of her trying to counter what happened in Iraq, trying to do more to support the rebels. I think uh, that's, that's just widely known. What is interesting to me is uh, Secretary Kerry coming in um, he came in with uh, he came in with a lot of excitement. Uh, many people had thought that uh, he had lived his whole life, if you will, to be Secretary of State. Uh, he'd been involved in foreign policy uh, as, since uh, being a young person. He's fought in Vietnam and made his name, if you will, on the on the stage here as a young man. And that moved, I think, feelings by many, certainly by me, moved to anger. Um, as we watched um, what was happening in Syria, what was happening in Iraq, to now, uh, we had a breakfast with him uh, just a week and a half ago, and, and uh, to me, it's become somewhat of a sympathetic figure in that he's out there uh, trying to deal with this, for instance, the situation in Syria, and yet there is no plan B. There's no support from the White House. Um, We've had General Allen in here, we knew, in March of 2015, who was, on his behalf, working hard to create a no-fly zone. I uh, was talking openly about it. Turkey was supporting that, and yet no decision from the White House. The, the clearest example to me of why our foreign policy has been such a failure was this weekend. Um, I know Ben and I were trying to set up a meeting to try to deal with the issue of JASTA, to try to come to some other option that might create an outlet uh, for the victims of 9-11 and yet not undermine some of our sovereign immunity issues. I know I've been talking to the White House for some time just to engage with us. Over the weekend, I talked to Secretary twice, Secretary Kerry twice, and we agreed the best way to resolve this was to have a meeting. 
a meeting with Chuck Schumer, a meeting with John Cornyn, a meeting with Ben and myself, a meeting with Senator Reid and Senator McConnell, and just to sit down and see if another option could be developed that might cause us to move in a direction so that there'd be an outlet for the people of 9-11 to, to have an outlet of some kind and yet maybe not have some of the adverse consequences that some of us fear. Uh, Secretary Kerry couldn't even get the White House to call a meeting. Let me say that one more time. The outburst yesterday from the White House over what happened is remarkable when they wouldn't even be, they wouldn't even sit down to meet with the Secretary of State and us to try to create a solution to a problem that they felt was real. So um, I have to tell you, I think, uh, I, I know all of you guys write books after you leave, I think it's going to be a fascinating walk through uh, what I believe to be a failed presidency as it relates to foreign policy an unwillingness to roll up sleeves and deal with the tough issues that we have to, uh, to deal with, and certainly there's no way to deal with them without conversation. Uh, and to not have a plan B, or at least maybe you'll share a plan B in Syria today where the diplomatic actions cannot be backed up because Russia and Assad realize that there is no plan B, never has been a plan B. So I look forward to your testimony. Um, I know I'm being a little tough on you today, but uh, I, I think it's in response to, to just seeing again why this failure has occurred, and that is the White House's inability to sit down, to get involved, to be willing to put forth uh, tough consequences when things don't occur. And again, uh, nothing could be more evidence of that than the unwillingness to even sit down and try to propose um, another way of dealing with the situation we dealt with yesterday on the Senate floor. So with that, I turn to my good friend, Senator Cardin, and uh, look forward to his opening comments. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Blinken, thank you for, for being here. Uh, Senator, uh, Chairman Corker and I um, have been uh, partners uh, during um, most of this Congress on this committee, and we share very similar views about foreign policy and priorities, and we've had an opportunity to, to work together uh, on many, many issues. And I, as I was listening to S Senator Corker at the beginning of his comments, I thought we were going to be able to continue that with his nice comments about Secretary Clinton, because um, I share those views on Secretary Clinton's extraordinary talent to conduct foreign policy. Uh, but, uh, and I share Senator Corker's frustration on JASTA. Uh, I think that was highlighted through circumstances that neither he or I could control, nor the, could the administration control. And that is that the timing of JASTA required us to take the veto override uh, before the recess. I think if we could have had that veto override during the lame duck session, we would have had more opportunity to explore ways in which uh, we could try to accomplish the, uh, the needed uh, removal of sovereign immunity that stands in the path of the victims of 9-11, but do it in a way that does not cause the risk factors that this legislation causes. And uh, neither Senator Corker or I, and I'm quite frankly the leadership, or the president uh, could affect that timing, because the timing the president had to act with a certain number of days. Uh, the Congress was required to take up the veto message immediately, unless we had unanimous consent, which was unlikely to be able to be gotten. So I think it put us in a position where our options were not as, as robust as I would like them to have been, and that included the president's options. So I'm not as critical as Senator Corker uh, of this administration, or. Secretary Kerry, I know Secretary Kerry felt pretty passionately about the JASTA legislation. He, he expressed his views. Uh, I had a chance to be with Secretary Kerry on a, a plane for a considerable period of time, and he used that opportunity to explore every opportunity we had here to deal with JASTA. So uh, I, I uh, very much admire Secretary Kerry's uh, uh, optimism and his unrelenting pursuit of peace in every part of the world, and we had a chance to experience that firsthand in Colombia. Uh, as we saw after five decades of civil war, 
a peace agreement signed this past Monday, and I was proud to be there uh, with Secretary Kerry. S Secretary Blinken, welcome back to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. It's not every day that we have a star from Sesame Street with us. For anyone who has, uh, has not seen uh, Secretary Blinken's guest appearance with Grover, I encourage you to watch him discuss refugees with everyone's favorite furry blue monster uh, before the President's summit on refugees during the UN uh, General Assembly uh, session. We know that you have just returned from a trip to Turkey and we look forward to learning about your discussions there given Turkey's critical role in the success of uh, of counter-ISIL campaign, ending the conflict in Syria and for broader regional ability. So it'd be good to, I know this hearing is on Syria, and in Turkey it clearly is a, a major player here. Charged with oversight of the State Department, the members of this committee have a fundamental interest in the success of U.S. diplomacy and U.S. leadership in the foreign policy arena. Secretary Kerry is correct in his belief that the tools of diplomacy should always be the preferred method for stopping violence, saving lives, and restoring stability. I want to commend the dedication of Secretary Kerry and yourself and our national, nation's diplomats for the work you've done on, around the clock with both allies and adversaries to forge an agreement to end violence in Syria. That's what we need to do. There is no there is no way to end that civil war through military. Uh, we need to be able to have a uh, negotiated diplomatic solution where all sides uh, respect a government that respects its rights. But now we are clearly at an inflection point. The U.S.-Russia ceasefire agreement was based on the assumption that Russia could compel the Assad regime to ground its air force that Russia would compel the Assad regime to allow immediate and unfettered humanitarian access. We have clearly seen that neither of these two objectives were achieved. Russia strives to be considered a peer, one that is essential to solving global problems. But I seriously question the reliability of Russia in this regard. We must reevaluate our approach to Russia in the Middle East and beyond the Middle East. Russia continues to attack Ukraine forces in Donbass. It illegally occupies Crimea. It has hacked into our commuter system and sought to destabilize our electoral process. These are not the actions of a partner. These are the actions of an adversary. And I think we have to recognize that. With our focus on Russia, we cannot lose sight of Iran's nefarious role in Syria and beyond. We know that Iran is backing the Assad regime economically and militarily. IRGC commanders have died fighting in Syria. Iran has mobilized mili militia fighters, provide intelligence to support Syria and Russia targeting, sent in lethal aid, and mobilized the Hezbollah. There must be consequences for these actions, and there are plenty of tools that we have at our disposal. I reject utterly false narrative that Iran and Russia's activities in Syria constitute counterterrorism. I look forward to hearing from you, Mr. Blinken, on what actions the United States are considering, what are our options, and how can Congress be your partner? Turning to Iraq just for a moment, if I might, the counter-ISIL fight is just the first step in restoring stability. I am cautiously optimistic that the military operations to push ISIL out of Mosul is resourced and planned to achieve its goals. And beyond the military operations, I want to raise the alarm bell about winning the peace. I think we'll win the war, but can we win the peace? Iraqi leaders in Baghdad must get their act together. The past few months of political infighting and mud-throwing instill no confidence that leaders in Baghdad, Erbil, and other provincial levels are prepared to put the Iraqi people first. Now, we know that the Iraqi security forces, the Kurdish Persian forces, and other forces cannot fight or bomb their way to a stable Iraq. What will come after ISIL's defeat? I am not confident that Iraqi leaders are sufficiently engaged to respond to the humanitarian crisis coming when hundreds of thousands of civilians flee Mosul. I am not confident that Iraqi leaders are effectively in control of the popular mobilization forces to prevent sectarian reprisal violence. I am not confident that Iraqi leaders are committed to recovering stabilization and governance plans that will give all Iraqis a stake in the peace. 
Weeks ago, I would have said the situation in the region, particularly Syria, could not be any worse. Now we know that it can. Russia is guilty of war crimes for bombing a humanitarian aid convoy. Assad is bar bar barrel bombing Aleppo with impunity and using water ac access as a weapon, as if denying humanitarian aid was not sufficiently deplorable. These are crimes against humanity. The longer the Assad regime remains entrenched in Damascus, and the longer ISIL and Nusra Front remain active in the region, the more depraved the situation becomes, the more hopeless are innocent civilians, the more susceptible are vulnerable populations to violent extremism, and the more strained our governments in Jordan and Lebanon to respond to these pressures. At risk is an entire generation of children in the region who have, have only known war and governments who want, and some governments want to stand with them, but have been unsuccessful. At risk is an entire generation of children who will only know refugee camps, who do not have access to clean water, health care, schools, and employment opportunities. This situation cannot continue. The U.S. must provide more decisive leadership to protect the civilian population. Mr. Ranking Member, I appreciate your comments. I, uh, um, I think this is what we've been saying since about 2011. Um, my comments about Secretary Kerry being a sympathetic figure are really not negative towards him. He's out there without the ability to do diplomacy because everyone knows there's going to be no backup effort in the event diplomacy fails, which is a recipe for disaster. We've known that now for five years. So again, it was more of an indictment of the President uh, than our Secretary of State. Um, but with that, um, our Deputy Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, who we appreciate being here today um, as a substitute, uh, we thank you for your service and we look forward to your um, abbreviated comments, your written testimony uh, without objection will be entered into the record. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. And let me just start by thanking you uh, personally as well as the committee staff for your courtesy in rescheduling this hearing to today. Uh, as you noted, it was originally going to be yesterday. I very much appreciate it. Uh, it did allow me to make uh, this trip to Turkey, uh, which I'm happy to talk about. Uh, and Senator Cardin, thank you for referencing uh, the best bilateral meeting I had during the week in New York at the UN General Assembly with Grover, uh, by far uh, the most uh, informative, uh, interesting session. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Ranking Member Cardin, members of the committee, uh, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the civil war in Syria and its regional implications. Um, now in its sixth year, this civil war has destroyed the fabric of life in Syria. It's killed at least 400,000 people triggered the worst humanitarian displacement crisis since World War II, put neighboring countries the first uh, asylum under enormous pressure, exacerbated regional tensions, helped swell the ranks of violent extremist organizations, most notably Daesh uh, and Al-Qaeda. The conflict continues to be fueled by patrons and proxies with very divergent interests and priorities at a time of unprecedented upheaval in the wider Middle East, as governments pursue new models of political rule, and vie for regional influence. In short, the Syria conflict presents one of the most complex challenges we have faced. The United States is clear-eyed about our role and responsibility. The civil war in Syria is not about us, nor can it be solved solely by us, but it challenges our security and strategic interests and our moral values. So we are working to leverage our country's unique capacity to mobilize others to end the civil war and contend with its consequences, even as we lead the international coalition to counter and ultimately defeat Daesh. We're also working to facilitate aid to millions of Syrian civilians, both in Syria and outside of Syria, to try to reduce the human suffering the civil war has engendered. Our primary task is to defeat Daesh, which poses the most immediate threat to our citizens, to our country, to our allies and partners. We have built an international coalition with 67 partners. We devised a comprehensive strategy to attack Daesh at its core in Iraq and Syria, dismantle its foreign fighter financing and recruitment networks, stop its external operations, and confront its affiliates. We are aggressively implementing that strategy, and we are succeeding. 
Our comprehensive campaign is systematically liberating territory from Daesh and denying its sanctuaries, cutting off its financing, stemming the flow of foreign fighters, combating its narrative, allowing citizens to return home, gutting the twisted foundation on which Daesh's global ambitions rest. We've deprived Daesh of about 25% of the territory it once controlled in Syria and more than 50% of the territory it once controlled in Iraq. And we now face a moment of both strategic opportunity and urgency. The opportunity before us is to effectively eliminate Daesh's physical caliphate by taking back the last big pieces it holds, Mosul in Iraq and Raqqa and Dabiq in Syria. With support from the coalition, local forces are preparing to launch these operations in the period ahead. These battles will be hard, but the consequences to Daesh will be devastating, both practically and psychologically. But this opportunity is matched by urgency. As the noose around Daesh is tightening, we've seen them try to adapt by plotting or encouraging indiscriminate attacks in as many places as possible. This puts a premium on destroying Daesh's external operations network, especially in Raqqa, where many of these operations are plotted, planned, and directed. Uh, in Iraq, uh, Mr. Chairman, two weeks ago, and then in Turkey this week, um, I held discussions with our partners on the campaign plan to liberate Mosul, Dabiq, and Raqqa. It requires extraordinary co uh, coordination, not just militarily, um, but also to ensure that we meet the humanitarian, stabilization, and governance needs of newly liberated territory. It will be this effort that ensures that Daesh, once defeated, stays defeated. And Senator Cardin, I think you're exactly right that, in a sense, the harder questions are almost what follows the military defeat of Daesh in Iraq and certainly in Syria. Ultimately, we will not fully succeed in destroying Daesh until we resolve the civil war in Syria, which remains a powerful magnet for foreign terrorist organizations that thrive in the wars on governed spaces and draw strength from Assad's destruction of his own nation. The objectives and processes that we agreed to earlier this month with Russia were the right ones. A renewal of the cessation of hostilities, the immediate resumption of unhindered aid deliveries, the degradation of and focus on Daesh and al-Qaeda in Syria, the grounding of the Syrian Air Force over civilian populations, the beginning of a Syrian-led negotiating track that can provide a pathway out of the conflict and make possible the restoration of a united, peaceful Syria. The actions of the Assad regime and Russia, aided and abetted by jihadist spoilers, now risk fundamentally undermining this initiative, destroying what was the best prospect for ending the civil war. The September 19 attack on a UN humanitarian aid convoy in Big Orem near Aleppo was unconscionable. It's been followed by the regime and Russia renewing a horrific offensive in Aleppo that includes the killing of hundreds of innocent civilians and apparently intentional attacks on hospitals, the water supply network, other civilian infrastructure. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Chairman, Secretary Kerry informed the Foreign Minister of Russia that unless Russia takes immediate steps to end the assault on Aleppo and restore the cessation of hostilities, the United States will suspend U.S.-Russia bilateral engagement on Syria including the establishment of the Joint Implementation Center. At President Obama's direction, uh, we also are actively considering other options to advance our goal of ending the civil war and starting a political transition in Syria. We continue to maintain close links to the moderate opposition to support their viability. It's important, as always, to remember how this crisis uh, in Syria began, not with barrel bombs or chlorine, but with peaceful protests of citizens who were calling for peaceful change. The humanitarian catastrophe that we bear witness to is a direct outgrowth of Assad's vengeance against his own people, and indeed the cost is rising every day for the region, for Europe, most of all for the Syrian people. We will continue to work with the coalition we built to defeat Daesh, and we will explore and, as appropriate, pursue every option to end the civil war in Syria and bring about the political transition that the Syrian people want and deserve. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm just going to ask one question and then may interject uh, as we go along. Is it, uh, from your perspective, having been both at the White House and now at the State Department in an important role, um, is it your observation that the only way for us to be successful in our foreign policy endeavors and for the Secretary of State to be successful is for there to be a close relationship between the White House and the Secretary of State and the knowledge uh, that the White House will back up the initiatives uh, that the Secretary of State in, uh, endeavors to achieve? 
I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, in any administration, uh, you certainly want uh, is a, that, close, that's a, a, yes, closer, a so close relationship among the agencies of the executive um, branch. We've had, uh, <clears throat> I know, numbers of proposals from the State Department, um, including the, the no-fly zone in the Northwest Triangle of Aleppo and the air exclusion zone along the Turkish Sharian border that the Turks uh, were supportive of. Um, why is it that in that case, uh, in the case right now where Secretary Kerry is out there on a tether, uh, you just mentioned that we're going to cut off bilateral negotiations on Syria. Uh, I mean, I just have a feeling that's just not much of a price to pay from Russia's standpoint. So there's been discussions of Plan B. Um, Secretary Kerry talked to several of us in Munich in February about the cessation discussions, and there, there was going to be a Plan B if they failed. I've never seen signs of a Plan B. Uh, I know Russia doesn't believe there's a Plan B. Assad doesn't believe there's a Plan B. Iran doesn't believe there's a Plan B. So when I say that, when I refer to a sympathetic figure, how can a Secretary of State have any chance of success in ending the murder, the torture, the rape, the bombing of innocent people, the killing of young people. How does the Secretary of State have any chance of success when the White House is unwilling at any level to have a backup to what he's doing if diplomacy fails? Um, Mr. Chairman, on all of these issues, including Syria, um, we work through a very deliberative process involving all of the uh, agencies uh, relevant to the issue um, at the NSC with the State Department, uh, with the Pentagon, with the intelligence agencies, uh, et cetera. And we uh, try to work through these things deliberately uh, and make the best possible assessment uh, of the best way to uh, advance our objectives and our interests uh, and to uh, evaluate both the benefits and risks of any course of action. And that's what we've done uh, in this case. And the policy that emerges is uh, the product of these deliberations that the Secretary of State is uh, very much fully a part of. Um, in the case of Syria, I, I think first it's useful for a second just to step back and ask ourselves this question. Uh, how do civil wars typically end? And we know from history and experience that they ended one in three I, I, I don't want a history lesson. Hmm? I'd like to understand what Plan B is, the, the mysterious Plan B that has been referred to since February, mm -hmm. the mysterious Plan B that was supposed to be leverage to get Russia to, to quit killing innocent people, to get Assad to quit killing innocent people. Just explain to us the elements of Plan B. Uh, two things, Mr. Chairman. In the first instance, uh, Plan B is the consequence of the failure as a result of Russia's actions uh, of Plan A, uh, in that what's going to ha what is likely to happen now, uh, if the agreement cannot be uh, followed through on and Russia reneges totally on its commitments, which uh, is, which it appears to have done, okay. Um, okay. is this is going, of course, to be bad for everyone, but it's going to be bad first and foremost. I want to hear about Russia. Plan B. Well, this I is understand all the, the context here. I think, sir, this is important because um, Russia has a profound incentive in trying uh, to make this work. It can't win in Syria. It can only prevent Assad from losing. If this now gets to the point where the civil war actually accelerates, all of the outside patrons are going to throw in more and more weaponry uh, against Russia. Russia will be left propping up uh, Assad in an ever smaller piece of Syria. All of us understand that. On what is Plan B? So, Give me the elements of Plan B. So two things. Again, the consequences, uh, I think, to Russia uh, as well as to uh, the regime will begin to be felt uh, as a result of Plan A not being implemented because of Russia's actions. Second, um, as I indicated, the President has asked all of the agencies to put forward options, some familiar, uh, some new, that we are very actively reviewing. Um, when we are able to work through these in the uh, days ahead, uh, we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to come back and, uh, and talk about them in detail. But we're in the process of doing that. Okay, so let me just say what we already know. There is no Plan B. And when I refer to Secretary Kerry as a sympathetic figure, I say that because he gets up every day, 
some say should resign over lack of support or at least threaten to, but there's no support. There's, it's impossible to be successful in negotiating an agreement with someone if there's no consequences. In this case, the consequences that you're laying out is that Russia will fully determine the future of Syria. I think Russia is so, going to uh, bear uh, very significant consequences uh, yeah. for the failure of this effort thus, as a result thus of far, the That hasn't been the case, and I know that's what the president said when they came in and stepped into the vacuum a year ago. So, so look, I rest my case. Um, uh, diplomacy without uh, within any plan of failure um, is uh, something that cannot be successful. And um, I, again, based on my experiences this weekend with an administration who's unwilling to even sit down and talk about a solution with the, with the people who are involved because they think this is bad for our country, but unwilling to sit down and talk about a possible option um, just leads me to believe that uh, um, we will continue to have uh, non-success in Syria, uh, non-success in other areas. And uh, again, all of us uh, have tremendous sadness over the fact that our country has idly sat by after encouraging the people of Syria. If you remember, Ambassador Ford was cheering these people on cheering these people on. We, we made commitments to the opposition, which General Idris, I remember meeting with him uh, in, 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 in Turkey. We couldn't even get him the trucks that we committed to. So it's a, it's a, a statement without a plan. It's, it's, uh, it's a statement of red lines without follow-up. And uh, again, um, I fear that more bad more bad results are going to occur with that. I'll turn it to uh, Senator Menendez. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank the ranking member for yielding time. I, I, we've had a train derailment in New Jersey with uh, fatalities, so I need to get back. So I appreciate the opportunity. This is an incredibly important topic. So uh, I think we had a lot of missed opportunities when this committee uh, passed, una uh, ver uh, not unanimously, but a strong bipartisan vote to train and to assist the vetted Syrian rebels, uh, moderate Syrian rebels, at the time that that could be done, uh, and gave the president the power and the wherewithal to do that. Uh, it wasn't done then. Uh, then when it was done, it was done so feebly uh, that the, those who we trained were largely eliminated. Uh, and then, uh, instead of having a safe zone, which many of us call for, which would have given individuals the opportunity to have a, a ability for security and maybe to organize those who might want to fight for their country. That wasn't done. And so uh, I move forward and I see what's happened to date. And the one thing, of course, your written testimony is much longer, but there's one paragraph on it that I think is incredibly important to talk. You, you talked about Dash, but you say in your statement on page three, ultimately we will not succeed in fully destroying Daesh until we resolve the civil war in Syria, which remains a powerful magnet for foreign terrorist organizations that thrive in the war's ungoverned spaces and draw strength from Assad's brutal destruction of his own nation. And I fully agree. But that's the problem here. Having missed opportunities now, uh, and now creating a vacuum where Russia comes in, I know that I keep hearing the equation that Russia will ultimately come to an understanding that it's paying very large consequences for its participation. That hasn't changed their calculation as all, at all. As a matter of fact, they have buoyed Assad uh, in this process. Uh, I think that the temporary truce that was created never had a real, from the Russian perspectives, never had a real calculation to actually effectuate the results of what Secretary Kerry uh, intended, which of course I would have applauded, but it was to give Assad the ability to, to rearm and, and, and reorganize. And then immediately the, the, the incredible, uh, despicable attacks made against uh, humanitarian convoys. So my question is this, I, uh, I, I would have asked what Plan B is too. I, I don't get a sense that there is one and that worries me uh, I don't think we should wait for the next president to start devising something that moves in that direction. And I understand that Secretary Kerry has threatened to end bilateral talks with Russia uh, over Syria. But I, 
can't fathom for the life of me what those talks are producing anyhow. I mean, Russia uh, seems to agree only for the purposes of giving Assad time to rearm and regroup. What, what leverage do we really have? What are we doing here uh, to Russia to change its calculation? Because now, you know, whether we like it or not, uh, they're the major player here. And I have had a totally different view that Russia does not share our end goals here. It does not have the same interests as we do. It has a very different set of interests. So understanding that, uh, give me a sense of what leverage, specifically, what leverage do we have? Uh, why are we still engaged in a conversation in which we have a quote-unquote partner that continues to undermine our purposes in Syria, as well as that of the international community, which is why I understand uh, some uh, British and uh, French counterparts walked out of a meeting recently at the UN. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, two things. First, we believe that the effort that we've made to reach this agreement uh, with Russia was the best way to effectively move toward ending the Civil War, because had it succeeded, and indeed, if it still can succeed, and I think we'll, uh, we'll know in the hours ahead whether Russia is responsive or not, the cessation of hostilities would be restored, humanitarian assistance would flow, uh, you would get the Syrian Air Force out of the skies over civilian populated areas, Russia would be focused, as it claims it, it has been, on ISIL and uh, Okay, so and we understand the benefit if it had right. succeeded. So that's so why we, that's why we put so much effort into it. That it's not going to right. succeed because Russia doesn't want to. Yeah. So again, I know that uh, this may not uh, fully resonate, but first, Russia escalated its engagement in Syria because it's been there all along, and it's been there for years, uh, precisely because it was at risk of losing its only foothold in the Middle East, and it came in harder in order to save Assad from falling at a time when it looked like he would, although uh, I think that assessment was probably overly optimistic. It's now in a position where having gotten in it's very, very hard to get out because Assad cannot win. They can prevent him from losing, but he cannot win. So, so they're stuck. So our leverage. So, that, so the leverage, the, in the first instance, the leverage is, again, the consequences for Russia of being stuck in a quagmire that is going to have a number of profoundly negative effects. First, they're going to be bearing the brunt if, this, uh, if the Civil War escalates as a result of their actions of an onslaught of weaponry coming in from outside patrons. Second, they will be seen in their own country and throughout the world and in the region as complicit with Assad, with Hezbollah and with Iran in the slaughter of Sunni Muslims. Fifteen percent of their own population is Muslim. Well, they're, they're Sunni. Already do we agree they're already but, complicit on that? Indeed, but this is only going to get worse right. if the civil war gets worse as a result of their actions. Uh, any efforts that they've been making uh, to get to peel away countries, for example, uh, on, on Ukraine, I think the international disgust at the actions that they're taking in Aleppo will make that even more difficult than it already is. So all of these consequences are there. But as I said, um, in response also to the chairman's question, uh, we're also very actively looking at additional options that we can bring to bear to advance our objectives in Syria. And those objectives are ending the civil war and getting a political transition. I, I know what the objectives are. I just don't see what the consequences that you're suggesting can be levied. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I know Senator Rubio is here, but he wants to get adapted, and if uh, you could go ahead, that'd be great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir, thank you, Secretary Blinken, again. Um, what has happened has happened, and I think history will reflect uh, decisions that were made and whether they were the right decisions at the time. We need to learn from the past and decide how to move forward. There's no question that there is an urgent need to protect human life, civilian life, in Syria. And the United States needs to act boldly. I'm encouraged, Secretary Blinken, by your comments that there will be very significant consequences for Russia's actions. I, wait, I look forward to seeing how that is translated into U.S. policy and U.S. international leadership working with other countries. We need bold U.S.-led actions to protect civilian lives. We need that now, and I look forward to reviewing with you the options that are being considered and the actions that are taken to protect civilian life 
and the significant consequences concerning Russia. I want to ask you a specific question. Could Russia have stopped the Assad regime from what it has done in the last several weeks? And does Russia have, influ have enough influence over the Assad regime to change their behavior? I believe the answer is yes. Number two, Iran has been extremely engaged in Syria. It, I have not seen the U.S. take action or work with the international community to take action against Iran in regards to their support of terrorism in Syria. Are we restricted because of the JCPOA? I, my understanding is that the terms of the JC, JCPOA do not restrict us, but has there been diplomatic restrictions as a result of the JCPOA that has limited our ability to hold Iran responsible for its actions in Syria? Uh, the answer is no, Senator. So why haven't we taken action against Iran? We have, and indeed, we continue with regard to Iran. Uh, with regard actions in regards to their activities in Syria? Yes, san sanctioned activities, entities that have... Uh, new, new sanctions have been imposed? Their sanctions have been imposed on entities uh, in Iran that have uh, sought to um, do uh, business I, to support the regime. I, I understand we have sanctions that are related to mm -hmm. their nefarious actions other than the nuclear activities, but I'm not aware that we have um, increased those uh, sanctions or have looked at ways in which we can apply more pressure against Iran. I, it's my understanding we've been pretty guarded in these activities. We put in place at the very outset of the, of the crisis, as you know, um, various sanctions with regard to Syria uh, to uh, isolate and put pressure on the regime. And those sanctions also include uh, sanctioning individuals or entities uh, who uh, do business in various ways uh, with the regime, with the military, et cetera. Uh, and in that, uh, in that context, uh, my understanding is that Iranian entities and individuals have been sanctioned. Are, are we, you said that we're looking, the president instructed to look at all options in regards to the current crisis in Syria. Is part of that taking action against Iran? I don't want to get ahead of uh, where we are in our discussions, um, but Iran is clearly, along with its proxy, uh, Hezbollah, uh, the most serious impediment to um, ending the civil war in that its support for the regime is the most significant of all. Now, as I said at the outset, I believe that given uh, the support that Russia has provided, support that has gotten greater since Russia uh, increased its, um, its uh, engagement in Syria, it too has the capacity to change the uh, actions of the regime. Uh, but there's no question that Iran uh, and Hezbollah are arguably the most important outside supporters of the regime. Well, I, I think you would agree with me that since the, since the uh, agreement, JCPOA has been agreed upon, Iran has shown no uh, slowing down of their activities in Syria. So I would hope that we would see some aggressive U.S. leadership to make it clear that that conduct doesn't get a free pass because of the JCPOA. So I would hope that that would be part of the options that are being considered. And let me also say, in regards to Russia, it's not an isolated problem we're having with Russia. Russia has attacked America through cyber, trying to compromise our electoral process. Russia has violated the Minsk agreements and is causing uh, Ukraine to be compromised today. And I could list a lot of other activities that Russia is participating in. So as we look at very significant consequences that Russia will play as a result of their failure to live up to the ceasefire agreements, I hope that in that equation will go these other activities so that there's a very clear message to Russia that U.S. leadership will not tolerate that type of conduct. And we're prepared to take unilateral action. And we're also prepared to work with the willing to make sure there is a price to be paid for their activities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. I'm sure that there will be more words said. Uh, I, I would love it sometime to, if there is a plan B, to have a classified briefing, if that's what it takes. I think we all understand that 
it's non-existent, and the only thing that is existent is is words. Um, Senator Rubio. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, Secretary Blinken, for being here. In your statement, you mentioned Russia six times, as you should. They're clearly involved, but there's an omission. I do not believe that in your testimony you mention Iran a single time. And, in fact, until Senator Cardin just raised it, I'm not sure it even been discussed yet in terms of Iran's role in this region. Earlier this month, you said you couldn't guarantee to the American people that the funds that Iran has received as a result of the payments that were made and of the JCPOA have not been used for terrorism. I, I think it's common sense that, in fact, they would do that. We've seen, for example, press reports that Iran's Guardian Council instru instructed its central bank to transfer $1.7 billion to the military of Iran. And, by the way, I don't think that number is a coincidence. So we've seen the top IRGC commander last week say that the IRGC and its allies supply intelligence for Russian airstrikes in Syria. And so I think the first thing we have to point to here is the fact that these pallets of taxpayer dollars that have been allowed to Iran have ultimately helped them help Russia target innocent Syrians in this quest to increase their dominance of the region or their role in the region and to prop up Assad. And uh, again, I, I don't know how we justify the transfer of all of these funds to the Iranian regime, knowing that the Iranian regime is deeply involved in propping up the Assad regime, and in the process, providing assistance to all these atrocities that are about to be committed by both Assad and the Russians. How, how do we justify that? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, first, as you know, um, uh, because you've been so focused on this for, uh, for many years, uh, Iran has been engaged in the support of terrorism and destabilizing activities, including in Syria, for a long time, during sanctions, in other words, before the nuclear agreement. Uh, during uh, the negotiation of the agreement, uh, and indeed um, since uh, sanctions have been lifted in the context of that agreement. So their conduct uh, has been consistent throughout. And again, it, they were doing this before when we had the sanctions regime in place because of their nuclear program. Uh, the one thing that has changed is we have taken a nuclear weapon off the table far into the future, uh, which is profoundly good for uh, our interests and the interests of our partners and allies. But as we've said um, all along, we fully expected that they would continue uh, to take uh, these um, actions in various ways, uh, in various places, uh, after the agreement. And that's why we have worked very hard to continue and indeed to increase our efforts to counter them. So we've worked very closely, as you know, with the Gulf, uh, Gulf partners, building up their capacity. Uh, we just signed uh, a record-breaking MOU with Israel to make sure that they had in place over the next decade what they need for their security. And we continue to implement uh, sanctions against Iranian uh, But I, I apologize. So the, only, the one thing that's changed, that basically they were involved in terror before, they're involved in terror now, and I consider their support of Assad to be part of that, mm -hmm. that the only thing that's changed is that now we've made it harder for them to acquire a nuclear weapons capability. I would say a second thing has changed, and is that they now have access to millions and millions of dollars they didn't have access to before. So you have the world's mm -hmm. key sponsor of terrorism, now has millions of dollars more than they once did. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence that they're using it to build hospitals, bridges, roads, orphanages, sponsor food programs around the world. We don't see aid convoys from Iran providing food and medicine to people suffering in Syria. What we see is an increased amount of support for the Assad regime and the sponsorship of terrorism. So one of the things that's changed is they now have access to millions of dollars they didn't have a year and a half ago. Senator, our best assessment... Uh, billions, I apologize, billions. Our best assessment is that given uh, Iran's very significant economic difficulties, uh, the vast bulk of the resources that they've had access to as a result of the agreement or as a result of the, uh, the Hague settlement, uh, these funds have been dedicated to the domestic economy, not to regional activities. Uh, under the um, nuclear agreement, we believe that they now have access to roughly $50 billion that have been frozen um, or restricted in foreign accounts. Uh, they need half a trillion dollars to meet their investment needs, government obligations, propping up their currency, et cetera. Uh, and as I said, they've engaged, alas, in these activities before, during uh, and after. And also, unfortunately, a lot of support that they're providing to terror, uh, to proxies, is not very resource intensive. Uh, so that's why, even as we have implemented the agreement, which uh, in our judgment is a very good thing for our security and that of our allies and partners, we have worked to intensify our efforts to counter these but, activities. But even if we assume what you said is true, that the money's been used to prop up their domestic economy, ultimately, if that were the case, that domestic economy would then produce more revenue that they could use to fulfill the funding needs of their priorities, which is terrorism and the propping up of Assad. I guess the point for the average American who's watching this issue, here's the bottom line. You have the world's supreme sponsor of terrorism, 
who now has billions of dollars more than they once did as a result of this, and we're somehow supposed to believe the bulk of it is being spent to improve the way their economy functions, and that somehow, because funds are fungible, that this is not being used to increase their other aims that they have around the world, and that includes the propping up of this extraordinarily vicious regime in, uh, on Assad and, and their enablers in Russia. And so, again, I think this is just another example of how this deal and everything that surrounds it has now provided more resources to the Iranian regime to continue to do what they did. And one of the things they do with the money that they've been given is they are able to, pr to fund their intelligence gathering capabilities that allow them to help the Russians with their airstrikes. And those are the airstrikes that struck a convoy a week ago. Those are the airstrikes that are decimating Aleppo and creating a situation on the ground that we have not seen in decades anywhere in the world. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. Um, Secretary Blinken, thank you for being here this morning. Um, sadly, I have to say that I share my colleagues' views that despite the best intentions that our policies in Syria have contributed to where we are today, and there was a news report that just came over that Russia has rejected our demands for a resumption of Syrian ceasefire and that they vowed on today to press ahead with their operations in Syria. So I, I guess that says to me, and, and I think the news has been very clear, that um, Russia has escalated the civil war in Syria, um, and they intend to continue to do that, and Assad intends to continue to do that, um, no matter what the expense is to his own people. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to beat the Plan B horse, because um, I appreciate that that you have not um, been able to share with us what might be being considered. But, and maybe you're not able to talk about what options are being discussed that we might still have in Syria. But it seems to me that we need to look at all of those options because the current effort is not working. And I appreciate the arguments you're making. I just don't think they're working. So let me, let me go on to a couple of other areas where um, I'm, I'm interested in what's, what you can share with us. On the Leader Summit on Refugees, and um, I thought your appearing on Sesame Street was a good thing. It's nice to let um, young people know what's going on. But can you talk um, about which states have been particularly generous? What has come out of that summit? What, what is being looked at to implement the commitments that have been made at the Refugee Summit? Right. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, as you know, and as the committee knows, um, we are facing the largest single wave of human displacement since World War II. Syria, of course, is what is generating a lot of it, but it's actually a global problem, uh, a global crisis, uh, because we see right. um, forced migration of one kind or another virtually on every continent. In Africa alone, there are about 12 countries uh, that are forcibly, uh, where people are, in effect, forcibly displaced by conflict. Um, Central America, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, around the world. So the president brought together countries and leaders from around the world at this summit in New York on the margins of the General Assembly uh, to take action, uh, not just to talk about the problem, but to do something about it. And that's exactly uh, what we did uh, and what he did. There were three objectives that we had going into the summit. One was to get more resources from around the world into the humanitarian support system because, uh, as the committee knows, unfortunately, it's significantly underfunded and it's basically over, overmatched by the scale and scope of the problems that we're facing. So we wanted to get more resources in and we wanted to get countries that hadn't participated as much to participate or to do more. Uh, and we succeeded. We've got. Uh, countries all told to put in for this next year uh, about 30 percent more than they did in 2015. So we're looking at billions of additional dollars for the humanitarian system. Second, um, we were looking for countries to make additional commitments to resettle uh, refugees. Uh, and we sought to basically double the number of um, legally resettled persons around the world over the next year. That objective, based on the commitments that were made, was also achieved. Third and finally, we wanted to help build the resilience of countries that are 
receiving refugees, basically the countries of first refuge and asylum. In the case of Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, which, as uh, the committee knows, have borne extraordinary burdens uh, with millions of refugees. Um, we wanted to increase support to them, but we also wanted them to make additional commitments to make sure that children could go to school and adults could go to work. Because, uh, as Senator Cardin said, um, we do risk a lost generation of children from these conflicts if they're not able to go to school. We now have commitments over the next year for there to be an additional one million places in schools around the world for refugee children and another one million uh, jobs, legal jobs, uh, around the world. So these are significant, these are real, these are concrete. That said, ultimately, uh, the answer to a lot of this um, has to be uh, resolving the underlying conflicts that are causing people uh, to flee, to leave their homes, to leave their families in some cases, to put their lives and their children in jeopardy. Uh, we recognize that, uh, and that, of course, is uh, why it's so important to work to end this conflict in Syria. But we did make a major uh, advance. Uh, now the critical thing will be to make sure the countries make good on their commitments, and we'll be looking at that very carefully. Thank you. My time is up, so I'll wait for the next round for other questions. Okay. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being with us today. A comment and then a, a question. Um, so at the heart of the most spectacular U.S. foreign policy failures of the last 50 years is hubris, is this idea that there is a U.S. solution, usually a U.S. military solution, to every problem in the world. You can read... Vietnam and Iraq and Libya through that lens. And this idea that's sort of being proffered on this committee, frankly, by both sides of the aisle, that there are these clear alternatives to the current policy in Syria or Iraq that would lead to a radically different reality on the ground is fantasy. I hate the place that we are in today. It is an ongoing global tragedy, but this idea that there was a magical moment in 2012 where we could have parachuted arms to the Syrian rebels and they would have overrun Assad is not true. Russia and Iran have had for a very long time equities in that country that are unequal to ours. They were always going to come to the defense of Assad with ferocity. This idea that a safe zone would magically change the reality on the ground is a fantasy as well. Our, our, our own military leaders have thrown cold water on this idea because it would involve some major ground forces to make it meaningful. And there are very few people in this Congress who are willing to support the major deployment of U.S. ground forces. And so I just say this because maybe, just maybe, every bad thing that happens in the world isn't a fault of failed U.S. policy. And maybe, just maybe, there are times and there are places where there is not always a U.S. answer. Now, I think we can be incredibly helpful. I think that we can work with partners to try to make this situation better. But I read the last three years as a continued ramp up, albeit very slowly, of U.S. military engagement in Syria and the situation on the ground for the Syrian people getting worse and worse and worse, not better, and better and better. And I think history should probably teach us that those two things are likely not a coincidence. And so I reject the idea that there are easy, clear alternatives that the administration just isn't looking at. This is a hard problem with no easy solutions. And we should operate from an assumption that there are not always U.S.-led solutions to terrible, intractable problems in the world. And so let me ask you a question about where this failing of hubris could get us in trouble in the coming weeks and months, and that's in Mosul. So a new announcement that we are going to put 600 more U.S. military personnel on the ground to help retake Mosul. Not an announcement that we are going to make a diplomatic surge in and around Mosul to try to solve some of the governance problems in that city. So share with, with us, maybe share with, with, with me an answer to my skepticism that 
a military surge in Mosul is ultimately going to solve the political problems that you correctly identify as the most intractable. We don't have a military quagmire in Iraq. We, we could solve the military problem in a heartbeat by putting another 200,000 U.S. troops back in. We have a political problem. And so Mosul seems to me to be an example of where you have responded to pressure to try to make progress by announcing a military surge. I have no doubt that with 600 or 1,200 or 1,400 U.S. troops, we'll get the military objective that we want in Mosul. But how does that get us the political solution? Nineveh is an incredibly diverse province, and what allowed for ISIS to overrun Mosul in the first place was not a military vacuum, it was a political vacuum in that city. So uh, how do we make sure that there is a political component here so that our military hubris that we often have doesn't get us in the same exact situation that it has over and over again in that region? Uh, Senator, if I have the chance, I'd like to come back to your uh, opening comment, uh, but I want to answer your question. Um, Mosul is uh, and will be the culmination uh, in, in the Iraq side of the theater of the counter-ISIL or counter-Dash campaign. And as I said at the outset in my opening remarks, uh, it's a vitally important opportunity to deny ISIL its physical or geographic caliphate, which has been at the heart uh, of its narrative and at the heart of its ability to project uh, success. So it's vitally important. But your comments are also vitally important because you're exactly right that this cannot be and indeed is not just a military effort. Um, we're working along multiple tracks at the same time in a coordinated fashion. On the military piece, uh, making sure that all of the forces are coordinated under one plan, uh, with Iraqi leadership, but bringing in all of the critical elements to include the Iraqi security forces, the Kurdish Peshmerga, and critically, tribal elements from Nineveh. Uh, there is uh, now um, an objective of raising about 15,000 uh, members uh, from the tribes, uh, and we're well on track to do that. That's part one. Part two is making sure that we have in place all of the capacity we need to deal with what are likely to be the humanitarian consequences of seizing uh, Mosul, and in particular, internally displaced persons. Uh, the UN is projecting that there could be up to a million people forced to flee Mosul uh, as a result of the effort to liberate it. Uh, we are working very hard with the UN, with the Iraqis, uh, to put in place everything that they need to care for these people with food, with shelter, with medicine, um, and that also uh, is on track. It's challenging, but it's on track. We've raised the money to do it. We're prepositioning resources. Third, Stabilization of Mosul itself after it's liberated so that people have something to go back to as quickly as possible. There, too, we've raised significant resources. We have a plan in place to do that, to restore basic services, basic security. Fourth and finally, uh, you're exactly right, governance. Uh, because unless the basic governance structure um, is um, in place and everyone agrees to it, uh, we're going to have uh, problems after the liberation. We've worked very hard with the Iraqi government, uh, with the Kurds, with other actors to make sure there's basic agreement on what governance will look like in Mosul and in Nineveh more generally, uh, centered on the governor, who is the constitutionally appropriate person uh, for the province, the provincial council, but also persons designated by Baghdad and by Erbil to support them, and the city itself, in effect, divided up into eight quadrants with sub-mayors to make sure that as much as possible, um, those making decisions um, are very closely representative of the people for whom they're making uh, decisions. So this is a coordinated effort, and you're exactly right. It has to bring in all of these elements, and that's exactly what we're working on. We've also tried to learn lessons from the past. In Fallujah, when it was liberated, as you know, uh, we saw some reprisal atrocities committed by the Shia uh, PMF, uh, Popular Mobilization Forces. We have made sure that for Mosul, there will be no uh, southern or Shia PMF going into Mosul City. Similarly, no Kurdish Peshmerga going in. And as I said, a significant hold force comprised of um, members of uh, Sunni tribes from the region, both um, in the security forces and in the police. So we've tried to learn from that. And also, as IDPs leave Mosul uh, and are screened before they go uh, to find refuge provided to them by the uh, government and by the United Nations, uh, we want to make sure that that process is done uh, as quickly as possible, keeping families together, and again, without uh, any of the um, divisive elements being part of it, including 
uh, the Shia PMF. So we very much have that in, in, uh, in mind. Just very quickly on your, uh, on your initial comment, I do think it's very important that um, we, uh, we not be bound by history, but we be informed by it. And in the case of Syria, um, we do know this. Uh, civil wars throughout history have ended basically in one of three ways. Uh, one side wins. That is not likely to happen anytime soon in Syria because the dynamic that we've seen is that as soon as one side gets the advantage, the outside patrons of the other side come in with more and right the balance. And that's been what's happened. Um, so what, what the, the dynamic is, outside patrons can make sure that no one loses in Syria, but it's very, very hard to make sure that one side wins. The second way these things end is the parties exhaust themselves. Tragically, what we see in history, at least, is that that takes on average 10 years. Syria is in year six. Someone objected at that time. Um, and when there are a multiplicity of actors involved, it takes even longer. The third way these things end is some kind of outside intervention, either military or political. Military intervention uh, of the scale necessary to actually end the conflict um, is technically possible, but then whoever does that is going to be left holding a very, very heavy bag uh, with all of the unintended consequences that will flow from that. And I don't think the United States, nor for that matter Russia or any other actors prepared to do that. That leaves, in effect, outside uh, powers, the United Nations and others, trying to put in place and, uh, as necessary, impose some kind of political resolution. That's what we've been working on because we've seen that as the uh, best way to try uh, to end this. Thank you. I uh, always appreciate the, my friend Senator Murphy's comments and perspective, and I think hubris certainly is uh, something that uh, can be the downfall of all of us. Uh, I'll say that hubris also, from the standpoint of making big statements about what the United States is going to do, raises people's expectations. Um, I think we certainly have made bold statements about what we were going to do relative to Syria uh, that were followed up with almost nothing. And in, the, in that case, we've caused the sons and daughters and brothers and uncles and sisters of those in the Syrian opposition to be slaughtered as they waited for those things that we stated we were going to do but never did. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, Secretary Blinken, last October, former President Jimmy Carter wrote in the New York Times that since 2011, the United States preconditioned that, quote, Assad must go has reinforced escalation of Syria's civil war and inhibited serious discussion about compromise solutions. Last Wednesday, President Carter published a follow-up piece in the Times calling on the entire international community to focus for now on just one imperative, stop the killing. He wrote that discussions should focus on a goal of temporarily freezing the existing territorial control without the government, the opposition, or the Kurds giving up their arms. Additionally, measures should be agreed upon to stabilize conditions in territories controlled by these belligerents with guarantees of unrestricted access to humanitarian aid. Sec Secretary uh, Blinken, what do you think about that uh, proposal? Uh, the United States could advance that even in the absence of Russian or Syrian agreement by proposing a Chapter 7 United Nations Security Council resolution requiring all parties to immediately stop the killing, stabilize civilian populations, and ensure full access to humanitarian relief for all victims of this war. Uh, Russia's ongoing atrocious behavior in Aleppo makes it clear that they would not support such a resolution. Uh, however, it would put them on notice that at the United Nations we were about to have this global discussion of the need to just stop the killing. Can you talk about President Carter's proposal, what you think about it, uh, and uh, putting aside the uh, Assad must go movement for the time being so that we can just begin to put an end to this humanitarian crisis? Senator, thank you very much. And, um uh, forgive me because I haven't actually, I haven't read it, so I'd like to be able to read it uh, in, in detail, but I've heard your, your description of it. Um, first, in effect, what we've been uh, trying to achieve uh, with Russia's support um, is uh, a cessation of hostilities that would, in effect, end the violence, the provision of humanitarian assistance to people who need it in besieged areas, uh, and as I said as well, taking the Syrian Air Force out of the skies over civilian populated areas, 
and getting everyone to focus on the common enemy, uh, which is uh, Daesh and uh, al-Qaeda or Nusra uh, in Syria. So in effect, that those were uh, the, the first steps that we thought were so critical. Now, if we were able to take those steps, we would then have in place the conditions under which all of the parties could um, begin to negotiate a political transition. I can see it, but it, it's, it's broken. So what do you think about taking it to the UN? Well, we're looking at taking we're, it to a, a chapter seven, escalating this thing mm -hmm. to a point where everyone is going to be forced to sit down mm -hmm. and to discuss it. You know, Syria, <clears throat> Russia might not like it, but at least we're going to be focusing upon the core uh, problem of <clears throat> of uh, stopping the killing. So we are very actively looking at what uh, more can be done at the United Nations. Uh, would, we that are include the, a, would that include so a to, chapter seven? Sure, except that, of course, Russia would almost certainly veto a chapter seven. And that's seven all right. Decision. That's so, all right. Let, let's have Russia veto it. Let's we, have Russia be, <clears throat> let's pin the tail on the donkey. Let's have the culpable parties uh, be put in place. Let's not allow them. I just think there's such an atmosphere of ambiguity um, it's just so complex in Syria, in Aleppo. Mm -hmm. There's so many parties involved that it's just very difficult uh, for the world to understand who has the capability. Of well, you're, you're, you're exactly right, Senator, and that's, that's added to the complication because we have a multiplicity of actors, all of whom have different priorities. Uh, our priority uh, has been, uh, in the first instance, Daesh, uh, because that poses the most immediate threat to us and to our interests. Uh, Russia's priority has been to... Um, keep uh, Assad in place, or at least to maintain its foothold in Syria. Uh, the priority of the Turks has been actually dealing with the Kurds and preventing them from right, having exactly. Kind of all that's region. true. All so that's true. all of these things, the Saudis have been more, most interested, I think, in checking Iran. So in all of these ways, uh, because people bring, come to this with different interests and different priorities, it makes it even more complicated. That said, I think you're right that uh, further turning up the heat at the United Nations uh, is something that we have to very, uh, very closely look at. Okay. The administration announced that this week it would increase the supply of arms to Kurdish militant groups in Syria to enable them to play a leading role in a future offensive to take Raqqa, a Sunni city, um, back from ISIS. What are the risks of relying on a Kurdish force for military operations in a Sunni Arab city? And did you discuss this with uh, the Turkish government before you made that announcement? So, in fact, I was in Turkey just, uh, just this week, um, and uh, we're looking with our Turkish partners and allies uh, very closely at how we uh, continue the campaign in Syria to take territory away from Daesh. What was their perspective on using Kurdish troops aided by the U.S. Uh, in Raqqa? Uh, as you know, Senator, we've worked in northern Syria. Um, with um, something called the Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF. Um, that has several components. One is the Syrian Arab Coalition, so predominantly Arab uh, forces, and it also includes uh, Kurdish forces, uh, in this case the, uh, uh, the uh, YPG. Um, and the Turks have not been comfortable uh, with um, support to this uh, Kurdish uh, element of the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces. Um, and it's uh, obviously caused some tensions, but it has resulted in taking back Manbij, which is, was a critical transit point for Daesh in and out of uh, Syria into Turkey and out of Turkey. Um, a treasure trove of information about their external plotting uh, came from that. Uh, and so we need to be able to work with effective actors on the ground uh, in Syria. That's what we've done. That's what we'll continue to do. But we also need to do it in a way uh, that um, respects the concerns uh, and interests of our Turkish, uh, Turkish allies. So we're in the midst of conversations with them about the best way to move forward, including on Raqqa. Okay, and, and if I could, just going back up to Mosul again in terms of your um, statement that it will be a Sunni uh, uh, government officials, Sunni police uh, that will be in charge of Mosul, um, does the government uh, in Baghdad agree with that? Have they signed off on that? Are they going to keep the Shia militia out? Are they yes, going to that, keep that, that is their commitment. Just as it is the Kurdish commitment to keep the Peshmerga, the Kurdish Peshmerga, out of the city. Um, and the core of the force that liberates Mosul will be the Iraqi security forces backed by uh, the coalition uh, with the support of the Peshmerga. The tribal uh, elements that are being um, trained, equipped, brought on board with the goal of getting 15,000 of them 
will be predominantly be the, the holding force once the city is liber, uh, liberated. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member, for closing comments. I just all want to thank our, our, our Secretary for your, your help here. I just keep us involved on the options being considered in regards to Syria. In regards to Mosul, it, it could be a, a wonderful advancement because militarily things look like they're in place. I share Senator Markey's concerns that in practice we don't see the ethnic reprisals that we've seen happen so often when territory has been reclaimed from ISIS grips. So uh, I think that's going to be more difficult in getting the confidence necessary. So uh, I just urge us to, to work together. And in regards to Turkey, I, I'm, I would uh, uh, enjoy getting um, talking to you, not through questioning here, as to how successful we are in getting our NATO partner uh, constructive and keeping the border closed, but also dealing with the Kurdish issues that don't distract us from dealing with ISIS. But I thank you very much happy for your to service and look forward to continuing this thank discussion. You. Uh, I, too, want to thank you for appearing today and um, thank you for your service and uh, mostly for your responsiveness. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do want to say that I think history does teach us a lot and, and um, I think running your foreign policy in a manner to be not what the last person was and that being your total basis for decisions, leads us to uh, a place that uh, has been very negative for U.S. national interest. And what I hope is going to happen, as people have watched and understand that foreign policy is much more complex, takes much more engagement uh, than just a policy of not being who your predecessor was. I'm hopeful that the next president um, and the next Secretary of State can learn from the failures uh, that we've witnessed and uh, hopefully uh, in some form or capacity uh, what you've learned from this will be helpful in that regard too. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd welcome the opportunity to actually pursue that conversation uh, at another time whenever it's convenient to you. I have to tell you from my experience, we're more engaged in more places and more ways than we ever have been before. I think there's a debate about the well, nature the negative, of our engagement. negative trend in no, almost everyone. I think, I think there's a lot of yeah. positive too, but I'd be happy to pursue that conversation. Yeah. Uh, I would welcome that and uh, would welcome that with Secretary Kerry and others also, um, which I know has been difficult to achieve. But with that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. The record will remain open uh, through the close of business Monday. And uh, if you could fairly promptly, with all the other responsibilities you have, respond to those. Um, uh, we thank you for being here and the meeting is adjourned.